can wish to see me married and raising my own children. <laughs> and this coming in my 24th year as a Jesuit and my 12th as an ordained priest. <laughs> She's still open. <laughs> Now, as a theologian and a priest, I believe that my mother's concerns deserve some serious consideration. Not only because she and others who think like her would like to undo the historical and doctrinal underpinnings of ordained priesthood in the church, but because I believe she wishes to see ordained ministry in a more relevant, meaningful, and life-affirming light. And so rather than quash any conversation that is perceived to question the validity and relevance of this discipline, I believe that it would help to clarify openly and less nervously what the sign value is for us as a Christian community and for the world in which we live. There are some theologians who have argued vociferously that African culture recognized and mandated celibacy for people entrusted with leadership and ritual roles on behalf of the community. Now while this may be true, there is also evidence that it did not necessarily constitute a permanent state considered integral to the overall meaning of priesthood in indigenous African religious traditions. Now to push the argument a little further, some cultures recognize priestesses as well. The functions of these priestesses were neither marginal nor merely tolerated. Rather, they were mandated and revered in those communities that had them. In my upbringing, in the context of indigenous African religions, a male priest was an exception. The norm was always a female priest, a woman. The point I'm making here is that culture can have implications for our understanding and practice of ordained ministry. But the cultural argument is a multifaceted one and very complex one that we need to use sparingly and very critically. In other words, it's a two-edged sword. But when used, I believe, critically, it can help us conduct the debate in a manner that is open, that is respective of difference, and also in reaching for the overall conception and practice of ordained ministry in the church. And I believe we need to talk about this, especially in the context of the church in Africa. To carry on the conversation, I would like to talk about the fourth trend, which I entitled unorthodox and dissident voices. This trend is related to, if not actually a continuation of the previous trend. Across East Africa, where I come from, we are gradually becoming accustomed to hearing a growing chorus of voices clamoring for a reconsideration of several aspects of ordained ministry in the church. And the local and international media indulge in a sensational account of the lives and escapades of former high and low ranking African clerics and ecclesiastics. And they are not simply repeating media reports of clergy sexual abuse of minors in Europe and in the US. But reporting on, if you like, homegrown challenges. I would like to mention just four examples of various manifestations of how these challenges, 
is perceived from the context of Eastern Africa. The first is the widely publicized case of a former Kenya Catholic priest, now turned anti celibacy campaigner. Another example or manifestation is the case of a high profile Catholic ecclesiastic who gained international media notoriety, first for secretly marrying a non Catholic woman, and then recently for being defrocked on account of his support for the movement married priest now, and for his ordination of married men as priests and bishops. Another recent manifestation is the establishment of a church known as Catholic Apostolic National Church by a group of former Catholic priests in Uganda and Zambia, now married, and attracting quite a significant following. The fourth and final example is a patent violation of priestly celibacy, an issue that the Second African uh, Synod considered as alarming and disturbing. And there is no need here to indulge a lengthy uh, account of uh, examples. The point is clear. Beyond examples, I believe that as a church, we need to ask for how long we can simply dismiss this trend as voices of rebellious, dissident, and sexually frustrated men who are bent on destroying venerable traditions and practices within the church. I also believe that given the blatant nature of some violations of Christian celibacy and discipline, to maintain silence would simply amount to hypocrisy on the part of our community. And to hurl anathemas at people who raise their voices would be to apply a discredited tool of our theological past and stifled debate. I see a need for dialogue not just with dissident voices, but within the community called church, about our theological assumptions and teachings on ordained ministry in light of contemporary understanding and development. In this context, where the agenda of such unorthodox groups and voices seem to readily win public sympathy. I wonder for how long an ordained ministry in the order of Melchizedek maintain its character, some would say lie, as a bastion of angelic purity and faithful practitioners of the discipline of celibacy. There's a question here for us as a Christian community that I believe deserves open, honest, and critical conversation. I want to talk about the fifth trend of taboo, which again expands the conversation of the last two trends. And I christen this sex, power, and priesthood. It is related to some aspects of the previous trends. We live in a church where recently and repeatedly, the hierarchy has been forced into a painful and embarrassing admission of some of the most egregious and despicable sexual crimes committed by priests and religious. The sex abuse scandals here in America and Europe raise very serious questions about the trinity of sex, power, and priesthood. Sadly, to avoid talking about it in our context and the covenant, 